It's time for Backstage Chats with Women in Music, where the stories and voices of female music makers inspire women like you to be dreamers, to be rule breakers, and to unleash your inner rock star. Podcasting from Austin, Texas, the live music capital of the world, here's your host, Thea Wood. Trigger warning for our audience. In this episode, we discuss chronic disease, mental illness, learning disabilities, and suicide. If you are experiencing any health issues or suicidal thoughts, please contact your healthcare provider immediately. Now, on with the show. Welcome to another episode of Backstage Chats with Women in Music. I'm your host, Thea Wood, and today we're at the Center for Music Therapy in Austin, Texas, where our special guest is making incredible strides in treating brain injuries, disabilities, and mental health through music therapy. Hope Young, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Well, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, We're going to get into the meat of what you do with your music therapy But before that, we're going to start off with what we call the shakedown. And the shakedown is kind of our icebreaker where people get to know a little bit more about you before we jump into the heavy stuff. Are you ready for the shakedown? You bet. All right, here we go. First question, who was your first concert? Three Dog Night at Michigan State University when I was in fourth grade. Yay, you're a Spartan. (laughs) It was great. Oh, God, yes. I wanted to go there so badly. Are you from Michigan? That's where I was living when I was little in uh, elementary school, but it's not where I ended up going to school. But yes, I thought it was, I was like in heaven. Elementary school kid with all those college students, three dog night. It was the seventies. Oh, heaven. I was in bliss. I had reached my nirvana so young. (laughs) I know. How do you top that, right? (laughs) All right. Next question. What was the first album that you bought with your own money? You're going to laugh. But back then, those were those little 45s, right? And I had this banana record player. So it was the Jackson 5. <laughs> and I'll be there. I mean, I listened to I don't know how my parents survived. And, um, of course, the Beatles. I want to hold your hand. Um, baby, you can drive my car. I just, yeah. You were a pop girl. I was. I was. Well, what's funny, if you ask my first album, but I don't remember if I bought it or not, it was actually Ray Charles. Those were all those little 45s, but I remember my first album that was mine was Ray Charles. And did you play the daylights out of it like I did when I was little? Yeah, I love soul, even as a kid, you know, but yeah, pop was pretty much it, but I did. I've always had a thing for soul. Next question, which artist or band is in heavy rotation on your playlist today? Pink. And Imagine Dragons, and Natalie McMaster, and jazz. I'm just listening to jazz a lot, but I would say right now, Pink. Next question. Which woman has had the most influence on your career? Two. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Hanser. She's currently at Berkeley's uh, College of Music in Boston. But when I met her, she was at University of the Pacific Conservatory of Music, and Audrey O'Connell who was the professor there as well in music therapy. Those two women really shaped the woman I am today and my professional launching pad. Well, that's exciting because we have another Berkeley of Music uh, professor who is going to be on the show as well, Susan Rogers, who's an audio engineer, and she worked with Prince and a number of other folks, but she was Prince's staff engineer for five years. One of my employees is a Berkeley grad. They're everywhere. <laughs> they are. They're great. Next question. Uh, if you could have dinner with any woman, dead or alive, who would it be? It's easy, Michelle Obama. <laughs> I, would love to, I would love to have dinner with Michelle Obama. All right, Michelle, you, there's one for you. I hope you're listening. That's right. Uh, next question, which is our last question, and it's a biggie. What is one life goal you'd like to accomplish before climbing the golden stairway to heaven? It's the culmination of the project, the Movement Tracks project. It's actually my biomedical music project. Really launching these 30 years have been um, pursuing making music this way accessible to the millions, to the masses. And so my final Alleluia course is especially on the movement with falls like we've done for the kids and the adults. But what you don't know yet is what we're going to do. The next use case is cardiac oxygen saturation especially for neonatal intensive care, 
the babies that you can kill with music, making sure music is done in such a way that yes, it's powerful, but it doesn't kill them or cause harm. And that that's every neonatal intensive care unit in the world, every baby and every adult too. But those are my two final life goals. It's interesting that you talk about the, you use the word healing or curing because we do talk about the healing power of music in a, in a figurative sense many times and sometimes in the literal sense. When you started working in music therapy almost 30 years ago, uh, did people really, when you explained what you're doing, did people think it was hocus pocus? No, not really. Now, there's two different audiences. If it was you and the general population, yeah, like it's always like, what is that, you know? But no, not in the medical arena. Where music therapy is known, it was deeply respected and, and people want it and they know it. So no, they don't ask what is music therapy. But you have to realize music therapy, by the time I came in, in the 80s, it was World War I, where we, Wilhelmina Harbert, who was one of the founders of University of the Pacific's degree program, that was the 1930s. She started in World War I in, in uh, the European hospitals for the vets and brought that over, and it started working immediately with the Department of Defense. Like by early 1940s, California had established it as a career. The U.S. Army, the Department of Defense were using it in hospitals with veterans and treatments. So where it was known, no, not at all. No hocus pocus. They really understand the difference. General population, though, you're right. It's still looked, it's compared to entertainment as a passive effect in the power instead of an intentional treatment that's accountable and liable for what it says and it does adding up. And I feel that people shake off or make fun of or dismiss things when, mainly because they don't understand it. And I was wondering if maybe you could give a little bit of the science summary of how music therapy affects the brain and affects healing in a way that people would understand and be able to take it forward. It's a human phenomenon that we all are born with, whether I'm hearing impaired, as you can see my hearing aids, and even children that are born deaf. Music is a human phenomenon all cultures across the world and has been for the last 40,000 years. So it's one of the only things that can and will activate the whole brain simultaneously, okay? So everything else, speech, you have, you know, one or two areas activating. Everything else will, when you do music and you do it intentionally, you can activate at the same time every area in the brain. That means if you've ever seen a PET scan, you know, the color imaging of a brain photo, mm -hmm. they have blue and they have red and they have orange, or at least it lights up like a Christmas tree. And that's a phenomenon. Nothing else can do that. So when we take the science of that, we don't always want to activate every area of the brain. That's called overstimulation, right? But what about if you do the research so precisely that you know what components of the music or what a person is doing actually doing something musical versus when somebody's listening to something in such a controlled and detailed way that we can intentionally activate a certain area or deactivate, like seizures. When that area is overactive from seizure activity, when you want to calm it down, that's blue. It turns blue. You can actually use music to calm that down and deactivate an area. That's precision medicine. That is precision medicine, but it doesn't act alone. You work in conjunction with uh, neuroscientists and biomedical uh, industry. And can you share a little bit about how that might work? Of course, the Center for Music Therapy is on the cutting edge of all of this. And um, since I founded the first for-profit music therapy center in the world, I've always pushed ahead of where a lot of people across the world are in music therapy. I just want to clarify that because when we're working with the neurologist and we're working with the biomedical device manufacturers, so when a music therapist is working live, like we're here right next to where an osteoneurologics clinic in space often with their patients. You are working for a very specific outcome for a very specific diagnosis that the doctor is working on the patient to treat. So let's take the example of Parkinson's disease. We have a lot of folks with Parkinson's. Uh, the uh, World Health Organization, uh, it's now a pandemic. Globally, it's growing and increasing in so many numbers, just like viral and bacterial at that same rate. So what do we do with Parkinson's in music therapy that can really help towards that problem with neurologists across the world and the patients who are asking for help? 
we know very quickly when there's parts of your brain that control how to move. When you stand up and you just get up and walk, well, there's a lot of things that just happened in your brain to be able to tell yourself to initiate that movement, to coordinate, I want to move. Your brain clicks in and initiates the movement quickly. You can step out and that leg's under your control and you don't fall. Well, unfortunately, with Parkinson's disease, that's not what happens. That doesn't all communicate the brain to the muscles and people stand up. They try to take a step and instead their legs shake, sticks to the floor, and they fall flat on their face often you know, causing worse damage with hip fractures. We are a very vital solution with the doctors, with the patients. When we're working live, we work with physical therapists to assess that gait, and we find it exactly where it is, how many steps per minute that patient can take, and we sync up music exactly to where what's called their intrinsic gait is. And from there, we know how to use those musical components to lock in the motor cortex, which is the one that's so confused. It's, it's the one that's supposed to tell the muscles when to start the mu movement and when to have that step finished. Mm -hmm. Well, it's all confused. It won't coordinate that to the muscles. We know how to set an auditory cue, like a metronome, right? Mm -hmm. To get that, measure it, fit it correctly to the patient for what they need, do this, and then the patient goes, and they have absolute control over their stepping out and continuing to go. Now, that's not enough. You also need things for turning, like mm -hmm. other musical components when they make a turn. Yes, they can keep turning on the heel strike, but oftentimes they have no arm swing. They kind of walk like a gorilla with their arms down to their side, no swinging. It's very hard to make a turn without being able to pull your trunk around. It's called trunk rotation or the arm swing. So we add other musical features for the turn to get the arm swing. Good, 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 good. It can be, you know, structures to get when they need to turn, to turn. I know that sounds crazy, but when you do dancing, do you naturally just respond to those real quickly? We do that. We don't want you to dance all over the world, even though I know that figuratively sounds great, but ask a Parkinson's patient if they really want to dance everywhere. No, they just want to simply walk into the bathroom, back up to their toilet without falling, and do their business and get up and not fall. We're taking that, that we've done that in little ages, so you know, in hospitals, I've literally sat there singing with a guitar, gone to the toilet with the patients, done all these musical elements, helped them get off the toilet and walk back to the room when the doctors have to take them off medication, which is a very scary time, because without your dopamine medication, you're almost paralyzed. So music therapists in the hospital, we do that. We supplement the medication for those doctors while they're trying to readjust medication so that patient is not paralyzed. But once they're home, it has to be through a recording, correct? Mm -hmm. But the recording can't change like that, can it? Once you hit play on your playlist, you hit play, that recording always plays back the same. Well, that's not how it works for a music therapy protocol to literally assist you wherever you are to help you have that same control of movement, right? So how do we fix that? So that's my new company that um, you see coming out of the Center for Music Therapy. It's a software, and that's biomedical music. Mm -hmm. So instead of a static playback, it only exists in an ecosystem where we have devices now. Have you ever worn a Fitbit? Or mm -hmm. Okay, so those are called wearables. And we have more advanced wearables that we partner with, so like companies like Biodex Medical Systems and Sensoplex. Sensoplex has what's called a rover that you wear on your right and your left leg, mm -hmm. if both legs are affected. They have a sensor that's called data or inputs on how you're walking. All the important things that we need to know, your cadence, which I was mentioning that, steps per minute. Velocity, how much strength is in the movement of the, it's called the step. Your step cycle, and if your right leg is taking the same length of the step as the other leg, it's called symmetry. These type of known kinematics that are universal in movement are provided to our software as an input. Our software takes our AI, which is we developed, the methods we developed, and we've been teaching and learning how to do this. And they provide a music output specifically on those principles. So if you need that cadence to fit exactly to your steps per minute, it provides that first. If it needs the turning motion, if you've got to go up, it's going to provide an upward do 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 do. 
I have to say, just because nobody can see me, but every time Hope is snapping her fingers, suddenly my head starts moving. Exactly. And it's not anything that I'm thinking of. It's just something that I naturally do. Even with that as a tiny example, everyday example, I think it kind of illustrates the point of what people with Parkinson's or cerebral palsy or what have you could be experiencing on a much finer level. Um, in fact, uh, we do, thank you very much, have a little clip here of a song that was that is used for your music therapy sessions. And I was hoping you could give me just a quick summary on what this particular piece of music is typically used for in therapy. So again, I'm going to use the gait or the walking. And um, again, you're always going to hear that hill strike. It's called the downbeat. Right? Any musician knows what a downbeat is. <laughs> the other thing you're going to hear is a strum on the guitar, which is a, an up, where the knee should be going up, and then it comes right back down where that heel should strike back down, right on the downbeat. So we're going to take uh, just a minute to listen to that, and then we're going to go on to the second part of our interview with Hope Young. So now we're back with Hope Young, and we are talking about music therapy today. Uh, we've already discussed a little bit about how the science works of music therapy, and especially for those who have disorders such as Parkinson's or cerebral palsy. I would love to discuss a little bit about how music therapy helps address the ADHD or spectrum disorders that we see in the news all the time. There's such a rise. There are so many conflicting theories and rumors and, and ways to address it. Can we talk a little bit about music therapy and how it's working with ADHD? And for the audience, just so they all know, this affects my family personally. We have an ADHD child and it's paired with dyslexia, which often go together. I have a pretty special interest in this. So I was hoping you could shed some light. Again, remember it's a phenomenon. We respond to it so much intuitively, emotionally, right? You can hear a piece of music and immediately go somewhere emotionally and even with memory, so quick. So music can be that quick, like whole brain integration that especially a child with a developing brain who is getting stimulus and expected to speak or write or try to do something when only one area of the brain can't talk to the other area. It's like running into a roadblock. Whereas music, what did I say? It can activate the whole brain. Now, again, it's a double-edged sword. You can overstimulate that child with music or you can appropriately stimulate that child for what is it that they need to do? What's the task that they're trying to do and have success at? If it's attending, you can see children get completely engrossed in music. And I know you've seen your ADHD child completely get engrossed with um, video games, right? You've seen them get completely engrossed. Like we have a lot of our kids who will just grab the TV or grab the radio and just love the music. But as soon as somebody turns it off, they go nuts. Or somebody turns on music that they didn't choose or that's out of their control and they're screaming, they're in pain and they're hitting their head on the wall. Again, what's the intent, right? So you have to think mus uh, of music as kind of a pocket knife. What is that something that my husband has? Has a screwdriver in it, bottle opener in it. A utility, utility knife. knife. Okay, let's just think of music more like a utility <laughs> knife that you want to pull out the right component of that music for what the intended outcome is. And you also have to let the child have a lot of control. They've got a lead here. So when we do an assessment of music therapy, we have a room just open with all kinds of instruments. And they're, I know it sounds crazy, but some of them will go only to the metallic sounds. Mm -hmm. Some will go only to dissonant sounds, like a crashing and a believe it or not, that can really be the magic that pulls some kids with autism or ADHD in. It may be acoustic. It may be only electronic. So you have to watch your child's reactions to these stimulus in order to make a good plan for what you intend to do. If we want them to develop like dysgraphia or dyslexic and these type things, you really want to be thinking about maybe instead of the, a passive response, like music being done to them, and instead actually have them make the music. That's the more powerful therapeutic 
treatment value of music for kids with ADHD, um, pervasive developmental disorder of any kind on the spectrum or otherwise, um, and dys dys dyslexia and dysgraphia especially, you want them being able to play the music. And do they tend to gravitate or respond more positively to a certain timing in the beat? Again, that's your child. If your child has something of a sensory processing disorder that's coupled with fine motor weakness, you're going to want to slow that down. You want to set them, that child up for success. So remember how with Parkinson's and cerebral palsy, we match the cadence to the gate? We don't ask somebody to walk at a normal 80, 100, 120 steps per minute that really intrinsically their motor cortex is really only able to move at 20 steps per minute. That's more normal for a child. Don't ask them or put on anything that would be above that. So it's the same with fine motor. Don't just send them to a piano teacher that will not assess and know what's the intrinsic value and then come up with devices or figure it out. Okay, the metronome only goes to 40 beats per minute. What do I do? You subdivide it. So every two beats, you play that so the child can successfully get their finger on that piano or make a bow strike. So you adapt to that child. Don't put them in the bell curve and then get mad at them when they're screaming because they're not succeeding or they're feeling like they don't have that fuel in the fuel tank like your other kids that are succeeding over and over because they fit. The way those teachers are teaching and everybody else is learning, they fit in that bell curve. You have to think outside the box. And that's where being a music therapist and having children with ADHD is great because those ADHD kids are really creative. They thrive at that. So give them creativity, but make it used to their benefit instead of getting trapped where it's only devices that are doing things passively to them that they're so engaged in and they're learning all kinds of things in gaming that couldn't they be doing the same thing? We've been in silos where it's just been a commodity like music, but we're starting to see these sectors see the value of coming out of that sector. Like we're, I've operated a music business in the medical industry for 30 years, and now I'm grabbing the tech sector and I'm merging biomechanics industry and the music industry. And what about, I know people are going to ask me about this uh, when they hear the episode, what about for kids who are taking medication already to help treat ADHD or ADD? How does, is this a supplement to that or can it eventually help the child wean off of the medication? How, how does that work? Again, that's a really important question. Medication, especially on a developing brain, you know, you want the child to experience success, but you also don't want to over-medicate. And a lot of kids, a lot of parents are trying not to use medication. So James Ochoa and the other really great ADHD specialists, there is no one answer for everybody. But when you find effective strategies and modalities such as music, I can tell you the kids wean off the medication. So usually when, if they're really little, they haven't started on medication. If they're in school, that's a different story. By the time they're in school, oftentimes they're just not able to keep pace without medication. Like I can tell you there's five kids that come to mind that I saw in the 90s that are now off to college and some are married that were hitting their head on the my wall screaming with their hands over their ears. And I can tell you from those journeys with those families with ADHD, autism, these type of things, that find the modalities. It's, it's a combination of OT sensory-based OT, occupational therapy is just so important, physical therapy, speech therapy. Music therapy is the key kind of factor that we're like this integrative piece that draws it all together that all of a sudden the kid will make big gains. But it's not a standalone. So when you put it in there, though, it integrates all those pieces in a way that suddenly the kid makes progress and is able to do things that's very normal. It's at home. It goes music. And what you can sing to yourself or do goes anywhere. What I will say is we often see an acceleration in the therapy when you get the music therapy added in there. And often then the doctors and the parents start fading back medication if they've been doing it. All of us need the power to, one, respect the child and listen and know that it's never one answer for anybody. And I know it's scary, but just I will say the music, though, in all of this in the story is the one stings that stayed with all my kids the rest of their lives. I've been doing it 30 years. So Carter, he's still in band, and he's in school, and, and nobody knows he has ADHD and autism. He's doing brilliant. 
I just read an article about how the suicide gap between men and women is narrowing, which means more and more women are experiencing depression, anxiety, hopelessness. Since we are backstage chats with women in music, I want to focus for just a moment on what are some tips that we can give women, especially with regard to music therapy, that if they feel in a really bad place besides calling 911, um, what can they do to help calm those feelings? The first thing is to trust your instincts. Even if you think that you're the sickest person in the world, go to music. Turn on music that matches your mood. Don't try to go to music that isn't authentically where you feel. So a lot of people will, will say, I won't listen to that because um, I should not. Parents often, at least when I was growing up in the 80s and some of my clients in the 90s, there were kids who had awful lyrics to music. I mean, killing everybody, saying everything. Yet it was an absolute appropriate way to express a world of conflict and anger and confusion and rage that was more appropriate than acting out on themselves or others. When you're feeling depressed, listen to music. That, you know, If depression is really anger, don't be scared to put on something loud and angry and take a ball and hit it against the wall or take a phone book and tear it apart or anything. Don't, don't be scared of that. But let somebody know. Why well, also don't go through it alone. Now, if you're at a more moderate stage of depression, the music, oftentimes you need to come in, you need to focus, you need to go in and find out what you're feeling and give it release, so journal it. The one thing, listening to music and not doing anything with it is when you're going to get in trouble. So if you listen to music over and over and you're sitting there very passively and it's amplifying thoughts of harming yourself, amplifying thoughts of harming others, and you're alone and you're doing nothing with it, I don't mean hurting yourself or others, that's not what I mean. I mean something that channels it in a way that doesn't hurt yourself and that it should start to move quickly into another feeling scape. It's called the ISO principle. If you start with where you are, if you're angry, now trust me, I did this with riots on psychiatric units and it does work. I start by blasting in the loud music, let the kids take the, the telephone books and throw balls on the wall and everything, get it out, and then we'd bring it down. What's the next level? something that's still moving, put drums in there, let them hit those drums, keep bringing it down. You know, we do hear, especially kids who are listening to gangster rap or things where you're like horrified about some of the things that are being expressed in this, but at the same time, you hear, but, but this makes me feel better, or this makes me feel good. And, you know, I can't, I guess I can't judge them for what makes them feel better or feel good, uh, because I'm the person who, if I'm overstimulated, you know what I do, I go to my car, and I sit by myself in my car and I turn on the music that I want to listen to and I'll do that for about 15 or 20 minutes. And it does. It makes me feel better. It's like my little adult timeout. And nobody's telling you what's right or wrong. If you're stuck in that music and you're stuck in those behaviors, that's a problem. But if you're using it and you know that I'm starting here with the intent to get calm or I'm sad, let me cry. Let me cry. The most important thing is to reach out to somebody you feel safe with. And if you're that person that's being reached out to, do your darndest not to judge what the music is, what it's saying. You don't know what it means. Right. Only that person that's listening is filtering it. It becomes their own story and their filter. And the most important thing is for you to sit silently and listen. You can ask questions, but if you won't just listen to anybody, listen to their music, and even if you stay quiet afterwards, you've just shared an experience and they're not alone. And if they're not feeling alone, their chances of harming themselves or anyone else dramatically decrease. Well, this is all amazing information and a lot of information for our audience to uh, take in and process. I would like to start wrapping up our interview, our chat, I should say, uh, with a fan question. And uh, in fact, it actually kind of goes back to what you were talking about in uh, Young Children and Loud Noises. Uh, this is from Christine in Detroit. And she said, does an infant or a toddler get adversely affected, she said specifically in the nervous system, by uh, extended exposure to loud music. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I was trying to tell you when I said one of my life goals, uh, especially in neonatal intensive care in infants. You have to remember, as adults, our nervous system has grown and developed. So our brain doesn't fully 
reach maturity until like age 25. Mm -hmm. So when you have those infants and toddlers with live sounds, you're dealing with startle response. If you see a gripping of the hands or an extension like this, you're overstimulating that baby. And remember, if we all did music 24-7, we'd be a wreck. Your brain needs silence. And even in silence, there's actual rhythmic. It's your respiration, the baby, the heartbeat, the mother's heartbeat, a simple voice of the mother, cooing, lulling, very appropriately stimulating. But then you want the baby to sleep or to rest. So you need these inner, you need these intervals of appropriate stimulation, but there are decibels and hertz where you're actually not only damaging their ears, you can you can lead to actual harming of infants. So yes. Yes, you need to protect baby's ears. So make sure that if you're taking them to an adult type music environment, they have the hearing protection, those headphones. Make sure that you're giving babies quiet. Never leave music on all night. That is such a rogue myth about the Mozart effect and classical music and babies. Stop. I've seen so much damage done with that. If they're listening to music and it's an academic, it's classical, leave it on while they're studying. Turn it off. Um, but please, that's a great question. I love you for asking that. And yes, the answer is you can do a great amount of harm. I thank you so much for answering that question. And listeners, this has just been an eye-opening educational experience, which, you know, we always have a lot of fun in our chats. And this one, I think we went a little bit deeper, but we learned so much. And I would just like to thank Hope Young from the Music Therapy Center located in Austin, Texas, who is making, like we said, tremendous strides and understanding how music can be applied in a therapeutic and treatment way so that we and the next generation have more options and more effective options in our healthcare. And that is just about wrapping up another episode of Backstage Chats with Women in Music. We are so glad that you joined us today. Remember, we are a nonprofit organization and we depend on your donations and support to get us along. So please go to backstagechats.com. Feel free to donate or volunteer or just subscribe to our podcast. And remember, why do we love these ladies in music? Because they remind us to be dreamers, to be rule breakers, and to unleash our inner rock stars. Take care, y'all. Hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Backstage Chats with Women in Music. This podcast is a production of the Backstage Chats Foundation, a nonprofit that is on a mission to eliminate gender disparity in the music industry by amplifying the voices and careers of women in music. You can make a difference by donating to the cause. Visit backstagechats.com and click the donate button today.